Glad to be here again um, for Prophecies of Hope and this important topic, America and the Mark of the Beast. When you hear that word, the Mark of the Beast, does it make you feel afraid? Does it keep you at night, up at night? No. When we go to God's word, we find that what God reveals to his people are things to encourage them. Amen? When we go to God's word, we find that God presents a message that brings peace. A message that brings hope. A message that strengthens our faith. And tonight, I believe that the message that you will be hearing will do all those things. Will give you hope. And will give you faith in the one who said it. Before I begin, I would like to invite you to pray with me one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. That you speak to us clearly. And even though sometimes you use symbols that are difficult to understand at first, as we continue to study your word, we see your revelation. A revelation of who Jesus is and the message that he wants us to share in these last days. We invite your Holy Spirit to be present and make things clear that I can't make clear. But we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you think of the mark of the beast, what comes to your mind? Maybe something like this. Some people think it's going to be a computer chip that somehow will be inserted into your mind. Some others think of maybe an identification card, something that the government will make and will identify each person, and that some consider it to be the mark of the beast. Others think of a barcode, and I remember when I was a kid, barcodes were starting to be used. And some people were saying, this is the mark of the beast. Something that we see often in grocery stores. Some might think that the mark of the beast has something to do with a credit card or some type of um, financial um, institution that is connected worldwide. Some recently have said, no, it's a vaccine. And some might think it's something that is written on the foreheads of men and women. The beautiful thing is that we don't have to guess what the mark of the beast is because the Bible tells us exactly what this mark is all about. And as we have been studying, um, the book of Revelation is a book with lots of symbols, yes? And these symbols represent things. And when the Bible says that they're marked on their forehead, what comes to mind? What is the forehead? And you can talk to me, I'm not afraid. The forehead is where people make decisions, yes? It's our control center, is where we think and make these decisions. And on the other side, the Bible also tells us of the seal of God that is on the forehead of God's people, yes? And that also basically indicates decisions that people make. And these decisions are made for God and not against him, okay? The theme of worship is a big theme in the book of Revelation. 
And not only in the book of Revelation, but we will also see that it's an important theme in the book of Daniel. How many of you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yes, a very well-known story that, that many of us maybe grew up listening and, 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 and hearing. And, and this whole story has to do with worship. Are you gonna worship this image that King Nebuchadnezzar raised up? Or were they gonna worship God, the creator of heaven and earth? We also see the, another story, sorry, um, in, in the book of Daniel, <laughs> chapter six, where Daniel is, um, does what he normally does, he prays. In fact, he prays three times a day. I don't know how many of you pray three times a day, but it's a, it's a good thing to do. And all of a sudden, there's this edict that the king decrees that for 30 days, no one should worship anyone else but the king. Again, this topic of worship is found in the book of Daniel. And so we should expect it to also be found in the book of Revelation. And this is a chapter that we've um, looked at before, chapter 14, and so we're gonna just go over some of these verses that speak on this very important theme. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And what is this message that he has? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. We looked at this verse not too long ago. And specifically to these last lines, worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Keep that in mind, because this is an important clue as to what the mark of the beast is in contrast to the seal of God. Revelation 14 continues on in verses nine through 10, and this is the third angel that followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, again, the theme of worship, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. These are pretty powerful words, aren't they? And when you read them, it kind of makes you think, what is this mark of the beast? What is it that basically the wrath of God is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation? But then Revelation 14, 12 tells us, and this is part of the third angel's message. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Very important clue as to what the mark of the beast is and what the seal of God is all about. Revelation 14, seven, worship who? The creator. Revelation 14, nine, don't worship who? The beast. Is that clear? Very clear. And then Revelation 14, 12 tells us that those who do not worship the beast, what do they do? They keep the commandments of God. 
and have the faith of Jesus. I believe that God is giving us here basically the antidote of how not to follow the beast, how not to receive his mark, and how not to worship its image. It tells us that God's people in the time of the end, because this is the context of these three angels, it's the time of the end. They keep the commandments of God and have the faith, the belief that Jesus shared with his disciples in the first century and shares with us today who live in the 21st century. So there are two clues here. Either we worship God, the creator, and follow his commandments, or we worship the beast and follow the commandments of men. Those are two clues that the book of Revelation gives us. But if we're talking about the mark of the beast, we need to know who the beast is, right? And praise God, Pastor Jim shared with us on Monday who the beast is. In fact, he gave us nine characteristics that describe who this beast power is. But if you weren't here on Monday night, no worries. Um, we'll share that today. And I want to share it in, in a way that What God says in his word is not to offend, is not to hurt anyone, but God gives us this information because it's important for us to know. So who is this beast? We learned that it's the Roman Catholic Church, a power that went against the commandments of God and followed the traditions of men. And for a period of 1,260 years has basically taught traditions that are not in Scripture. I have family who are Roman Catholic in fact, all of my wife's family is Roman Catholic. Good people, amen? God's people, amen? They, they live up to the light that they know. They don't know any better. And when we come together as family, they have lots of questions. And we have the opportunity, especially now after COVID, um, they've been sharing with, we've been able to share with them, and we've been able to um, teach them what the Bible says regarding the teachings of Jesus and what he has said in his word. So it's been a great privilege to do that. So who is the beast? The beast, as we learned, um, was Rome. That was a persecuting power during the first century. It was papal Rome, or Christian Rome, that also was a persecuting power during the Middle Ages. And the Bible tells us, in both the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation that Rome will once again 
repeat what it did during the Middle Ages. So, what is the mark of the beast? What is this mark that Rome has promoted throughout centuries? What is this mark that Rome has made it a sign of its authority, of its um, strength and power, and basically has taught, and many have followed, and many had continued um, to do the things that Rome has taught. Let's go back to Revelation 14, 7 once again, um, identifying these important clues as to what is this mark of the beast. We learned, again, that the first angel calls us to worship the creator. Um, the third angel calls us not to worship the beast. And those who do not worship the beast keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So what is the mark all about? It's about making a decision between worshiping God or worshiping the beast. It's about keeping the commandments of God or the traditions of man. And it really comes down to these two questions. What is the sign of Rome's authority that has to do with worship? And what is the mark of Rome's power that forces us to choose between God's law and man's law? So we're gonna look at a few quotes that will help us understand this. And this comes from the St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, um, May 21, 1995. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to what day? Sunday. To Sunday. And there's a little bit of debate as to when this exactly happened. And for sure, by the fourth century, this was done. It was changed. By the year 325, um, Christians had stopped worshiping on Sabbath, and now we're worshiping on Sunday. And it says the following, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of what? Of its own power. They recognized in scripture you will not find this change. But they made that change. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become what? Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday, holy. And this is a quote from St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel of May 21, 1995. Three issues that we want to consider. Man's law was placed where in this case? It was placed above God's law. A church, an organization, a human organization, uplifted its own power above what? Above the Bible. And man's authority was elevated above God's authority. It brings the Sabbath back to the forefront. And as we looked at Revelation chapter 14, 
verse 7. Remember, I asked you to remember this section. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is almost a direct quote from Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. So when the first angel invites us to worship God, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. It's an invitation for us to remember the Sabbath day as a day of worship. One more quote from the Catholic record, September 1, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof positive of that fact. This is, again, these are Catholics who write, in this case, the Catholic record, and basically see Sunday as our mark of authority. The mark of authority, in other words, we can read here, is a mark of her power and authority in religious matters because much of the Christian world honors Rome Sunday and ignores the Bible Sabbath. Louis Segur Um, also wrote in plain talk about the Protestantism of today, and he said the following, Thus the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the church. In other words, the Catholic Church recognizes that all who follow this particular day follow it because of the change that they made from, sun, from Saturday to Sunday. So the issue basically comes down to this. There are two marks. God's mark, the Sabbath, found in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, or we have Romans church mark, which is Sunday a day that venerates the sun, a day that has to do with a man-made commandment and not with what God has said in his word. And we can see, once again, the choice that we have to make. Do we follow God and his day of worship or do we follow mankind and what they think is the day to worship. Once again, we come to this very important um, passage in Revelation chapter 14, um, where we're invited to worship the Creator on His day, where we're invited not to worship the beast. And those who do not worship the beast They keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And I believe that the Sabbath is at the center of God's commandments. It's right there in the middle. It's the one commandment that has the name of God. It's the one commandment that tells us who he is, his title, creator of heaven and earth. It's the one commandment that invites us to worship him. 
It's God's seal right there in the middle of these Ten Commandments. And for some of you who might like archaeology, I don't have a picture of this, but most of the laws written by kings in the time of the Mesopotamians, in the time of the Akkadians, in the time of the Babylonians, they would put their seal that had their name, that had their title, they would put it right there in the middle of their law. And God, once again, puts this very important commandment, the fourth commandment, right in the middle of his law. Daniel 7.25. We said we would talk about Daniel. And clearly Daniel tells us in Daniel 7.25 that this little horn power will intend to change what? Times and law. Did you know that the only commandment in those Ten Commandments that has to do with time is the fourth commandment? That's the only one. It's the Sabbath commandment. And yes, this power intended to change the times and law. So our next question is, why is this important? And why make it a big deal? Because the, the book of Revelation tells us that it's important. The book of Revelation tells us that this issue between Sabbath and Sunday is something that we will face in the time of the end. What are we going to choose? God's mark? The Sabbath? Or are we going to choose the sea beast's mark? Sunday. As we've noted, um, the Roman Catholic Church clearly states that this is the mark of her authority. But Jesus... He invites us in John chapter 14, verse 15. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But we started our topic this evening with the title, America and the Mark of the beast. So does the Bible ever mention the United States in prophecy? As we've studied, um, the scriptures don't mention all the nations. It mentions especially those that have to do with God's people. It mentions those nations that in history as well as in the present time will play an important role concerning God's people. And Revelation chapter 13 speaks about two beasts. And I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles, because I like opening my Bible. I don't know about you, but I like opening um, the Word of God and, and going there and studying it. So let's go to Revelation chapter 13, and let's go to verses um, really quick. We're going to read this because I think it's important. Verses 1 through 10 that talk about these characteristics that we saw on Monday that help us identify this beast power. And I'm going to read. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. And keep note of this. Ten crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet and his mouth um, like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all of the world 
marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And we discovered that 42 months also is in the book of Revelation, 1,260 days, which are this time period of 1,260 years, beginning from the year 538 to 1798. So during this time period, this first beast would have this kind of power and authority. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear, this message, and I'll skip verse 10 here. But clearly, it talks about this first beast power coming out of the sea and reigning during these 42 months and basically having people um, worship it as well as the dragon. But what, what about this second beast? And this second beast appears in verses 11 through 17. Why don't we read this together? Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. So this second beast has power, has authority, and is able to cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. So the second beast power has authority to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand on our, or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Is this a powerful beast? It's a powerful beast. It can create an image to that first beast. It can breathe figuratively speaking, life into this image of the beast. It could cause the whole world to follow this beast image. And if they do not do this, basically they are punished even by death. So what are these activities of the second beast? It will rise to power and be like a lamb. 
it will eventually speak like a dragon and cause all people to follow the first beast. It will set up an image to the first beast and make that image speak. It will force people to worship the image and receive a mark. Are those clear characteristics found here in Revelation chapter 13? I think we, 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 we um, read it, and, and it's very clear that these are characteristics of this second beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 tells us, I saw another beast coming out of where? The earth. In contrast to that first beast that came out of where? The sea. And as we learned, the sea represents people, great populations. So in contrast, this beast, the second beast, comes from an un populated or sparsely populated area. And it tells us also that he had two horns like a beast. Now we know that um, a beast represents, according to Bible prophecy, it represents a nation. It represents people. And who does this nation or this beast represent? Where does this nation rise from? What we know is that it's a new nation rising from a new land. And what we also know is when does it rise according to Bible prophecy? The first beast, as we noted, um, began to grow in power in the year 538. Um, this time period, um, as we, we, we shared, um, this is when Justinian gave a decree and made the Bishop of Rome an authority, not just in religious matters, but also in civil matters. This is also a time when the Ostrogoths were in Rome and um, they were defeated, and they pulled away and left. And so the power of the Bishop of Rome started to, to become stronger and stronger, and throughout history, it became strong until it declined, and in the year 1798, the Pope was taken into prison, and that is where he died. So this has to happen toward the end of the 1,260 years according to what Revelation 13, 11 is telling us. Another important characteristic is that this nation is like a lamb. Not like a goat. It's gentle. You can approach a lamb. You can come to it. And it'll, it won't harm you at all. So it has this very nice characteristic. This new nation in the beginning will have a gentle character. But as we will continue to study, the second beast also is unique in that it doesn't have any crowns. Like the first beast, like the sea beast. It has no crowns on its horns. And crowns refers to kingly authority. It refers to a monarchy. It refers to one person consolidating all its power in that position. And the second beast has no crowns on its two horns. 
So this is another important clue. So let's look at this lamb-like beast. It has to rise around 1798. It has to rise up in a relatively unpopulated area. No crowns on its horns, indicating no kingly authority. It would be a new nation or a young nation. It would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence in order to do all the things that are described here in Revelation 13. Can anyone guess, by looking at all these characteristics, who this nation, this lamb-like nation, can be? It's the United States of America, a nation that I'm proud of being a citizen of this nation, a nation that has been a refuge for so many people who have been fleeing political persecution, religious persecution, social persecution. A nation that welcomed my grandparents when they came here in 1971. They came from the country of Cuba. And yes, they were fleeing religious persecution. And they heard about this nation, a beautiful nation that opens up its arms to all people from all nations. And they made that decision to come. Even if they had to leave family behind, even if they had to live, leave their little piece of land behind, even if they were ridiculed. At the time, it was President Johnson who was the president when my grandparents were coming. And, and, and my mom and sisters, uh, they, they were the Johnson girls. That's how they spoke of them in Cuba. My grandfather was a traitor because he was coming to the United States of America. But this nation is described in Revelation 13. And we want to see if this is true. And you're welcome to ask questions after this um, meeting. America was rising to power around 1798. It was a new nation in a relatively unpopulated area. There was no kingly authority. It offered freedom through a separation of church and state. And that's something that is unique about the United States of America. You go to any other country in the world before 1798, before that year, and you find nations where the religion of the king was the religion of the people. There was no separation. If your king was Protestant, everyone was Protestant in that nation. If your king was Catholic, Everyone was um, Catholic in that nation. And then you have some examples of countries where both exist. And it was, again, um, based on the governor, prince, or king at that time. It would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence. And if we think of the United States of America today, it's a nation that is known around the world. A nation that when it speaks, people listen. They pay attention. It's a nation that was founded on good principles. 
This is found at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty. It's a poem that says the following. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And so many people have come to this country seeking refuge, seeking prosperity, seeking a place they can call home. And maybe many of your parents or grandparents came to this country with those same ideals, looking for a place that they could call home and find opportunities that this land granted them. And it's a beautiful thing that we have called freedom. I wish the prophecy ended there, but it doesn't. It doesn't end here. Revelation 13, 11 says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like what? Like a dragon. Exactly. Spoke like a dragon. How does the dragon speak? It speaks with force. It speaks differently from how God speaks. And basically, America, for the longest time, has been a place where church and state have always been separated. But the time will come when this nation, as it gets more influence and more power over the nations of this world, will start to act more like the dragon and will start to make or bring these two entities, church and state, back together. So how does a nation speak? It speaks through its laws. And Revelation 13, 12 tells us, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this nation, not currently, but in the future, will make laws that will make people in the world to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. America will exercise the kind of power and authority that papal Rome had in the Middle Ages through a union of church and state. And as we know from history, any time that church and state comes together, it's never a good thing. Because if you don't follow what the state says regarding a particular religious practice, you can end up being persecuted. And as we look at today's news, does this seem possible? Is this something that could happen in our environment? Do we see America exercising more of its power and authority over the nations? Do you see America exercising more power and authority over us, its citizens? We see things changing. And sadly, not for the better. 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 14 through 15 says, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to that image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's pretty drastic, what Revelation 13 is telling us that this nation will do to those who do not worship the beast or its image. When church and state unite to enforce religious practice, America will look like Rome. It will exercise the same kind of authority that was seen during the Middle Ages, during the Dark Ages. And again, this is not meant to scare anyone or to hurt anyone or to offend anyone. But this is simply what God is telling us here in Revelation chapter 13. You might ask yourself, why would anybody want to bring church and state together? Why would anyone want to take this separation away? Pope Benedict XVI, in a speech at St. Peter's Square, June 6, 2012, said, Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone, so people can be free to be with their families and with God. By defending Sunday, one defends freedom. This is something that was said. Sunday is the day of the Lord and of man, a day which everyone must be able to be free. Free for family and free for God. And this is another quote um, from a North American Orthodox Catholic Theological Consultation. Recovering the theological significance of Sunday is fundamental to rebalancing our lives. We strongly urge both clergy and laity to work cooperatively within their communities to stress the importance of Sunday for worship and family. The rediscovery of this day is a grace which we must implore. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but lately um, there's been a lot of reconciliation among churches. Yes? And even today, um, Episcopalian, Anglican um, priests can serve in a Catholic Mass. And Catholics who want to serve in a religious realm can serve in an Episcopalian and Anglican church today. Have you noticed that no one's protesting anymore? No one. No one is saying anything that goes against the word of God. And many leaders today are looking at Sunday as a possible solution, not just for the situations that families are facing, not just for the situations that workers are facing, but also, they say, the environment needs a day of rest, a day where people will not work, will not travel, will not do things, and that also will help the environment. And so we see all the social problems happening in our world. And many religious leaders are thinking, what can we do, what can we do to bring back society to the word of God? What can we do to bring back society to connecting with each other? What can we do? And Sunday comes up time and time again in these conversations where they see a need of a revival, and that America and the world need to come back to God. 
but forcing someone to worship on any particular day. Is that a good way to do things? It's not a good way to do things. God always invites us to do things. He tells us what his will is, but he never forces anyone to do it. And so, once again, this idea of bringing state and church together never bring good results. This was once already um, done in history. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people reciting in cities rest and let all the shops be closed. And this was Constantine in the year 321 A.D. The law was supposed to bring a divided people together. He thought, how can I bring the Roman Empire back together? It seems like it's falling apart. And so he thought of implementing a day of rest, a day to worship. And he brought Sunday, which was by the pagans, a day to worship the sun. And he said, well, on this day, Christians and pagans, we can all unite and in this manner bring our nation together. But it's never a good idea to force people to unite, especially on worshiping on any particular day. And what we're finding out is that people have to make a choice. Are they going to follow God and his commandments or are they going to follow the beast and man's commandments? In the classic book, The Great Controversy, those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy. So we see that God's people who go through this time period will be persecuted and will be denounced as being the cause of all the troubles in this world. Stubbornness and contempt of authority, they will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Page 607, it says, as the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes bolder and more decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment and some will be offered positions of influence and others rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. Revelation has already shared with us that God's people will have his mark and the beast has its own mark. And we need to make a decision. Who do I worship? Do I worship God or do I worship the beast? Do I follow God's commandments or do I follow man's commandments? Revelation 14, 12 tells us what God's people does in this time. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Is that clear? It's clear. This is the kind of people that will be able to resist the pressures brought upon it by either the state or any religious organizations. And what we're actually invited to do is to surrender to God and to choose Him 
and to follow him. We have this story, or we have this verse in Psalm 91, 14 and 15. It says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Is that a promise? That's a promise of God. He will deliver those who set their love upon God. Those who call upon him and he will answer them and he will deliver them out of their troubles. We have a decision to make tonight. And the decision is, do we follow God and what he has clearly stated in his word? Or do we follow mankind or any religious organization and what they say we should do? Who do you want to follow? Who do you want to trust? Do you want to trust Jesus and follow his commandments? Or do you want to follow man and follow its commandments? Tonight, I'm going to invite you to take out your response card. Take out your response card that you received. And you're going to put America and the mark of the beast. And therefore, response number one, it says, I choose not to worship the beast or receive its mark. I will not follow the laws of the country when they conflict with the laws of God. If this is your decision, please mark, check this box here as your choice. And this is something that you alone get to choose. I don't get to choose for you. Your spouse doesn't get to choose for you. This is something that you alone can choose. And as response number two tonight, I choose to worship him that made heaven and earth by keeping the seventh day Sabbath on Saturday. Again, this is your decision. And if this is your decision, check box number two. I would like to pray with you tonight. Because I know this was a fairly heavy topic. And, but an important topic. A topic that God has revealed to us through his prophet John. Found here in chapters 13 and 14 of this beautiful book called the book of Revelation. And tonight, I would like to just pray with you and ask for the Holy Spirit to help in the decision that God wants you to make. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity that you've given us to study your word. We thank you for the message that you give us to trust you no matter what to follow your commandments no matter what, to have the same faithfulness of Jesus no matter what. You're inviting us all, those of us who come and have heard this message before, as well as those who are hearing it for the first time. You're inviting us to put our trust in you no matter what. And Father, we thank you again we thank you for the promises that we find in your word, that you will answer us when we call you, that regardless of the situations that we might go through, that you will be by our side, that you will be our wonderful shepherd. And so again, we thank you for this opportunity to study together, and we ask your blessing on each person here tonight, for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have...
Just a few more announcements before we leave. And Monday night at 7 p.m., Revelations Remnant. This is a topic you do not want to miss. Coming up on Monday at 7 p.m., Revelations Remnant. And then on Wednesday at 7 p.m., Revelations to Women. You do not want to miss this subject as well. And then on Friday at 7 p.m., the end of sin. Thank you so much for your patience and for your attention and have a great beginning of the week.